Ever since I could understand it, physics has enthralled me. The world began to make sense more than it ever had before. This summer I attended a two-week program on quantum physics. I knew it was going to be a challenge, but never in my life did I expect that I would learn a part of linear algebra in three and a half days and to be able to apply that to quantum physics problems. On the first day of class, our teacher stood in front of a completely silent and clearly scared group of teenagers and said, anyone can understand the concepts, but until you can understand the math, you can't truly really understand quantum physics. There's so much about the quantum realm that we don't understand, but we do know a little. I don't know quantum physics in its entirety, that's for sure, but I've learned a little bit. And today I'd like to try and leave you with a piece of it so that you too can have a better understanding of the smallest parts of our universe and how emerging quantum technologies can affect our lives. What is quantum physics? I've heard it described many ways. Enlightening, our most perfect theory yet, brain melting and terrifying. I can attest to the fact that quantum physics is all these things and more, but if you feel you're losing your sanity, you'll find your way back to it, but this time with a little something extra. Quantum physics is the study of quantum theory. Quantum mechanics is the mathematical language used to describe that theory. In quantum theory, there are four main postulates, or rules, that help shape the linear algebra used to describe the smallest particles we've been able to find. These are, very simply, one, a qubit, which is the way that information is stored in a quantum system, can be described by its state, which can look like this. This means that a qubit in the state psi, which is that Greek letter, is in both zero and one states at once. This is called superposition, when one thing is really two or more things at once. Two, the evolution of an isolated quantum system can be described by a matrix, which is just a set of ones and zeros, which can look like this. And three, an isolated quantum system can't be isolated forever. Once something about it changes, those, those superimposed qubits collapse, meaning that they're no longer in a superposition of both values, but are either one or, or either or. And finally, four, the probability that that qubit will collapse to either the zero or one states can be described by equations. Another very important property of quantum materials is their ability to be entangled. To be entangled means to be perfectly correlated. When two things are entangled, they have the same state. And, there, and when one collapses, the other one will collapse to the same state. But what does quantum physics actually look like? Quantum physics is in the language of linear algebra. When doing quantum physics problems, you really only need to worry about two numbers, one and zero. This is because, that those, value, these is, this is because those values are able to represent the most simple quantum system, called a two-level system. It's called this because in a two-level system, there can only be a superposition of two values rather than more. Overall, quantum physics and therefore quantum theory is a complex mix of theory and math. What are the uses of quantum technology and why do we even care? One of the most prolific quantum technologies to date is the quantum computer. There are countless stories about them in the news. The quantum computers are one of the most anticipated technologies that people know very little about. To explain how a quantum computer works, I need to explain some of the basics of the laptop you probably use every day. Um, in your laptop, information is stored in bits. That's an answer, but it's an intangible one. Those bits in your computer's hard drive are actually microscopic regions of magnetic field. Depending on the strength of the, that magnetic field, which is range in rows and columns, um, is the bit is equal to either one or zero. And the sequences of those ones and zeros, called binary, make up the files that might be near and dear to your heart. A quantum computer also uses bits, but these aren't any regular bits. These are quantum bits, or qubits. In terms of quantum computing, these qubits can't just be made of anything. They have to be made of quantum dots, which are rings of just a few atoms. And these quantum dots can't just be made of anything either. They have to be made of something called a superconductor. A superconductor is a material that, when cooled down to almost absolute zero, can begin to display quantum mechanical properties. To explain how a quantum computer, or how, um, or one of the benefits of quantum computing, I need to talk about things in terms of classical and quantum. Classical physics is the type of physics you learn in high school. It applies to things bigger than protons or neutrons, which are subatomic particles. Quantum mechanics is really like to describe it in a metaphor, anyway. If that zebra in the sketchy zoo was really a zebra, or it could be a painted horse, or if you can use your imagination, both at once. 
Currently, there are some equations that it would be impossible or unreasonable to try and solve with a classical computer. This is because uh, of the sheer amount of data and operations it would take to do that problem. It might be better to put our time and energy into creating something that would be able to solve those problems in a single lifetime rather than a few. This is where quantum computing comes in. Solving problems classically can be very different from solving problems quantumly. Let's say you and a friend have 50 candy bars. Your friend takes one candy bar and puts it in his back pocket. Then he takes the 49 other candy bars and hides them. Now your job is to figure out which candy bar your friend has in his back pocket. If all you could do was ask questions, what would you do? A quantum computer would start, or a classical computer, sorry, would start by asking, do you have the Snickers in your back pocket? The classical computer would try to solve the problem through the process of elimination. In the worst case scenario, a classical computer would ask 49 questions and receive 49 no's before it could receive the right answer to the question. This would take a lot of time as well as data. Uh, because every time that the quantum computer would receive a no, it would have to store that no, and it wouldn't stop storing no's until it could receive a yes. But if you were to ask a quantum computer how to solve this problem, it would only take one question to identify your friend's candy bar. This is because the quantum computer is able to visualize the single candy bar in your friend's back pocket as a superposition of the 50 possible candy bars that it could be. It can then calculate the probability that that candy bar will be the, that each candy bar will be the chosen one. The difference between classical and quantum holds true. Solving problems quantumly can be much faster than solving them classically. This could allow us to solve equations we thought were unsolvable in the past because of the sheer amount of data and operations it would take. Not only could we solve increasingly complex equations and learn more about our greater universe, but IBM theorizes that quantum computers could help us improve the way that AI processes data, the way that we analyze complex chemical reactions, and even help us make better investments. Another innovation that could come with quantum computing is better encryption. Quantum encryption would allow us to, in short, send a quantum state and receive classical information, or send a qu classical information and receive a quantum state. Uh, these two terms, or types of data transfer, are superdense coding and quantum teleportation, respectively. It sounds all quite complicated, but has the possibility for being one of the most secure terms of data transfer we understand to date. This is because of two other similar theorems in quantum mechanics. Generally, they state that if the information being sent is intercepted by a third party, that this third party will not be able to um, understand the message being sent without first knowing the structure of the quantum system that they're sending, called the quantum state, or the structure or the key to decode it. If the person receiving the message were simply able to receive it and understand it right off the bat, a basic physical principle would be broken. Nothing can move faster than the speed of light. Therefore, in both quantum teleportation and superdense coding, at least one piece of information needs to be sent classically. There's so many possibilities for quantum computers. No wonder the whole world is shaking in anticipation of them. But with innovation comes sacrifice. Are we ready for quantum computers? Take the example of the candy bars. If that could be repeated, but for your password to your Instagram account, your bank account, or even your email for, with high efficiency, if quantum computers were to become mainstream, it is possible that our entire encryption network would have to be reworked to rise above the new ease of decoding. But how do we keep those decoding keys a secret, and how do we transport them safely? Quantum computing is fantastic, but it's not bulletproof. We want more knowledge and more power, and with this comes our push for innovation. But with innovation comes sacrifice. Are we ready for the quantum world as we reach for it now? What lies beyond that event horizon? I'm absolutely terrified, but I'm also terrifically excited for what lies ahead, and I hope that we can all see it with our eyes one day. I encourage you to learn more about the things you don't understand. Don't turn away just because they seem daunting. Chances are you aren't the only one that feels that way. Most people probably do. This phenomenon, where people sprint from the classroom because they believe they will never be smart enough, never in their lives be able to understand something, reminded me of a Richard, a Richard Feynman quote that I'll leave you with today. It is my task to convince you not to turn away because you don't understand it. You see, my physics students don't understand it. That's because I don't understand it. Nobody does. Thanks.